Right, everyone. Well, I'm, I'm here, as, as Thomas said, for, to represent the Tartan Institute of Marketing, uh, which is my other hat. Um, so these views are very much my own views about blogging, but I'm very, very passionate about blogging. So hopefully that will come across and hopefully I can inspire some of you to uh, get into blogging if you currently aren't blogging or get more out of your blogging if you're, if you're doing it currently. So my message is very much um, carry on blogging because I think um, blogging has, in recent months, and particularly in the last couple of years, has actually been sort of overlooked slightly because everyone's got very excited about social media, Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest, and you know, there seems to be a new social media site at every turn. Um, and a lot of businesses are actually sort of thinking, well, blogging's really old hat now and I should be getting engaged with social media. And I definitely think that social media, I'm not saying that you shouldn't get involved in, in using some of the other channels like Twitter and, and Facebook. Um, but don't overlook, just as you wouldn't overlook some of the traditional marketing techniques such as email marketing and even telemarketing and direct mail is seeing a, a comeback um, because everyone's inboxes are so busy. Um, so don't overlook some of the more traditional um, channels um, in your marketing efforts. So I want to see a show of hands. How many of you in the room today have got a business blog? Yeah, I'm preaching to the converted. Um, that's, that's good to see. Um, I actually say, I'm actually, I was quite late to blogging uh, for my own business. Um, I started off using Twitter mainly because I felt, because it was microblogging. Um, and I felt that I didn't have enough time to blog and therefore, being a marketer and knowing that if you, if you start on the road of, of blogging, that you actually, you know, you should carry on consistently doing it and not give up after a few months when you get bored or you run out of topics or, you know, something else comes along that takes your fancy. Um, I started with Twitter and actually felt that Twitter wasn't delivering. It, it's been quite an effective channel for me, but it wasn't delivering some of the results that I wanted. So I then started blogging about, about 18 months ago now. Um, and I've seen some amazing results in terms of what it's done for the quality and quantity of my website traffic and the leads that I'm getting into my own business. And I'm obviously, as a marketing consultant, it's a service business, it's not an e-commerce business, but I'm going to try and talk today a little bit about how you can apply blogging, particularly in, in e-commerce and um, hopefully for some of you other service businesses as well. So if you don't use um, blogging, what other marketing techniques do you currently use? Shout out the techniques that you're using. What's the, the, the most successful marketing technique that you use in your business to generate sales or leads? Email? Word of mouth? Probably repeat business from your existing customers. Any other suggestions? Social media, and I know Zoe's very, very active on social media. It's very, very effective for you. So, okay, let's go on to um, the reason I'm really passionate about blogging, actually, and um, I'm going to come on to talk about sort of inbound and outbound marketing is that as small businesses, the reality is, I mean, I've come from a corporate background where I was very lucky to have very large marketing budgets. When I was at Avis, I had 6.3 million to spend on an advertising campaign across Europe. That is not the reality of the clients that I work with today, I can assure you. Um, several hundred pounds or several thousand pounds might be the limit of their budget for the whole year. But those principles that the, you know, that the big boys use, we can definitely use in our small businesses. But the one reality that we have to understand is that we are not able to communicate our message using some of the old-fashioned traditional marketing techniques such as advertising, which was very much about a one-way conversation and sort of shouting your message and then people were listening and they would hear it and you'd get your message out there. If you're a big brand, you know, you've got a big budget, you're in a very privileged position. But for us small businesses, we have small budgets, so we have to make them work really, really hard. And that's where some of the techniques that people refer to as inbound marketing or content marketing come in and blogging comes within that sort of field. So you'll see on the left hand side there, there's the sort of old fashioned, you know, print advertising, television ads, um, cold calling, you have telemarketing, um, email, which I still think sort of sits on that outbound. So it's all about broadcasting your message. But on the right hand side, we've got a lot of the techniques that we're all now using, search engine optimization, using video, social media, 
Um, and blogging is one of the techniques that's all about inbound marketing. So the concept is you create interesting and relevant content that attracts the right customers to your business. So rather than just going out there and doing an untargeted, sort of shouting your message out using traditional marketing channels, you actually develop content that is focused on your target audience, your ideal customers, and it's relevant and interesting and it attracts them to your business, which if you think about it, it's got to be a lot more efficient, um, particularly when you've got a small budget to actually get your message out there. So why blog? As I said, um, there's been a lot of hype around social media, and I do think you know, a lot of small businesses, unfortunately, are, are getting swept along a little bit by the bandwagon effect. And we're all hopping in there and trying out all these different things. You know, we talked about Pinterest, and we've got Google+, and I'm sure there'll be a plethora of other platforms that will come along, and we'll all wonder how we coped without you know, not having these things. Um, but as I said, blog, blogging should not be overlooked. Now, I've got some quite interesting statistics. I thought, you know, rather than me just standing up here and, and saying how good blogging is, you'd want some evidence. Um, and I went to the trusty HubSpot. Now, this was a, a survey that they've done for 2012. Now, it's, a lot of it's US data, but to be honest, the behavior of, of UK con, you know, consumer and businesses is not vastly different. And this was sort of quite up-to-date data that I could get my paws on. So I thought I'd share this with you. Um, and this looks at, on this chart here, we're just looking at the average cost per lead of using the old-fashioned, as we talked about outbound marketing, where you might be using television adverts, print media, telemarketing, versus the newer world of inbound marketing and attracting people to your business, of which blogging is one of the techniques. You can see there's a massive difference in terms of the cost. And that's, you know, that's not, I'm sure none of us are really shocked at that. Um, you know, Traditional print media and advertising is very expensive. You have to do a lot of repetition, opportunities to see, as we call it in marketing. So you've got to get your message out there with the right level of frequency for people to see it, understand what you do, and engage with your, your brand or your product or service. So it's just quite an interesting contrast of, of the cost differences. And blogs, actually, in terms of the average cost per lead, came out it's one of the most um, effective. So you can see there, if you look at all the social media, we've got search engine optimization. And interestingly, on the right-hand side here, we've got the, you know, the old-fashioned outbound marketing. And inbound marketing is very much stealing, stealing the show in terms of effectiveness. And again, we can see that small businesses, as I've said, you know, we have limited budgets. So we're embracing a lot of this inbound marketing techniques. Um, and it's very much sort of some of the bigger corporates and the larger organizations that are still relying on some of the, the old-fashioned you know, outbound techniques. And you can see their blogs came in, particularly for the one to five employees, 11%. So very, very effective, effective channel for small businesses and allowing us, actually, as small businesses, to actually compete on a level playing field with some of our bigger, bigger rivals, which until you know, things changed in the last few years, we were never able to, to take on you know, the, the bigger brands. So it means that for your businesses, um, particularly e-commerce, that you can actually go out there and create a web presence and a position for yourself in the marketplace. Yes, you may not be able to compete with Amazon, um, but particularly if you've got a niche, you can get out there and, and compete effectively um, online. One of the interesting questions that I get asked quite frequently by clients is, is how often should I, should I blog? Um, and they normally ask this question because they don't want to blog. Um, and they're a bit like, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to find anything to say. Um, surely I only need to do it once, once a month. But there's a lot of data and studies that shows that the frequency that you post your blogs and the number of blogs that you actually um, have within your website will have a dramatic effect and it's very much an exponential effect and I've noticed this in my own business when I first started out with blogging I probably didn't start to see the full effects until I've been blogging for about six months um, and I was blogging sort of about 10 to 12 times a month so I was blogging quite a, quite a high frequency to start with 
Um, and I've slowed that down a bit, because I think I'd be exhausted otherwise. Um, but I started to see the effects after about six months. Um, and the higher the frequency, because obviously if you only blog once a month, you're going to put 12 blog posts out there in a year. That's not a huge amount of content um, that's out there that's going to be indexed by the search engines and attract visitors to your website. So obviously the more that you can do, I mean, I, for customers that, and clients that really are struggling with blogging, I do try and um, encourage them at least to do it once, once a week. So they're doing it sort of four times a month, so they get a little bit of a sort of momentum and frequency. If they can do more, um, obviously I encourage them to do so. And there you can see that the, um, as I said, it is sort of exponential in terms of your blog post frequency and versus your customer acquisition rates. So all of the data is indicating that, you know, the more you blog, um, the better the results that you'll get. And this was another piece of HubSpot research that they did um, last year, which again looked at the volume of blog posts that people have on their, on their website. And obviously, the lovely thing about blogging is that that content is static on your website. And I think the thing that a lot of e-commerce businesses struggle with is that products are changing frequently. So content can be changing quite frequently. It's not on your site for a long time to be indexed by the search engines. Um, if you st create static content in the form of your blog, it's going to be there, you know, forever. So, you know, the blog posts that I have on my website, you know, that content doesn't just disappear overnight. It's, it's there. It's been indexed. I think I, I went onto a very sad website. Um, it's called, Is My Blog Working? If you're, if you're really sad, like I am, you can go onto that website and you can actually type in your URL and it'll tell you how many times that Google and Bing have indexed your, your website. And the difference that blogging makes in terms of the number of pages, I think my site had been indexed like 650 times, which I was quite shocked at. But I've got over 200 blog posts. So the more content that you've got on there, obviously to Google, your site looks more important. It has more relevance to pe what people are searching for, and therefore it'll get indexed. But again, there is this exponential effect that once you get to a certain number of blog posts, 50 plus, you really start to see the benefits. So if you do start blogging, don't give up too soon. Can I have a show of hands? How many people have got less than 50 blog posts on their site currently? A few there. How many have got sort of up to 100? Ooh, that's on Thomas. How many have got more than 100? Yeah. And some feedback, are, are people finding that what effect that's had on traffic? Did you notice this effect in terms of it works, yeah. Anyone else got any sort of little insights to share in terms of do they agree with the, the sort of exponential effect? Yeah, yeah. It, you have to keep at it. Um, but obviously, once you've got a, a raft of content that's on there, as long as you've written, we'll come on to talk about sort of, you know, topics and, and how you decide on writing your content, because for a lot of people that's a big struggle, um, you, you will sort of see the benefits. Um, it's, you know, like I said, it's had a massive effect for my business and I'm seeing it for my clients and talking to other people, the effects that it has. And interestingly, I thought I'd just put this slide on, because we've talked about, Karen I know was talking about social media earlier and it's been mentioned quite a few times today, um, just looking at acquisition by channel. Now obviously there's quite a big difference from, you know, no surprise that LinkedIn and blogging potentially has more of a B2B bias and then we're seeing more of Facebook and Twitter being more effective for consumer. But I do think that, that blogging has quite a strong role to play in, in business to consumer marketing as well as, and that's my area of specialism, rather than just B2B. But you know, that slide didn't shock me. That's, that's probably what we're, you know, we're all in our gut feel. We sort of, we know. And this is another interesting little snippet. Um, blog posts that are shared on Twitter, and I think this is, this is the, the key thing in terms of your marketing, is never to think of any of these things in isolation. And the danger is that we always, you know, get onto one new thing and we start doing it, and we sort of forget about what, you know, marketing terms is called integrated marketing. Makes it sound really complicated, but it, you know, in terms of joining all of our marketing activities together, and I'd always say to clients, you know, maybe do five or six things really well, 
and, and try and join up all of the activity and leverage it across all of the different channels rather than doing 10 things but then running out of steam because you've either run out of budget, time, enthusiasm, hours in the day. Um, that, you know, that's the reality for all of us. But you know, using something like Twitter as a channel to amplify your, your blog message and expand the reach of that can, as this data indicates, can be very, very effective. So how do we think that blogging can help your online business? For me, um, blogging, I think the key thing and the difference between a lot of the other marketing techniques is it's a fantastic tool for brand building um, and in terms of positioning your organization, your business, your brand in the marketplace. And it's a great way to engage with customers because you, know, you can have great products, you can have a really well-designed website by Bweb. <laughs> so he's not, <laughs> so he missed that plug. <laughs> um, but ultimately, you know, that's not enough. And, and me as a marketer, you know, ultimately you need them to understand what the business um, is offering and your proposition. Um, and you need to engage with those customers and make them feel, to a certain extent, confident about buying from you um, and or coming back to the site and, and buying again. So blogging can have a very, very powerful role in doing that for your business. And as I said, you know, build, build your business brand, um, it's fantastic for improving your search rankings. Um, as I said, you know, my site got indexed 600 odd times, which is, you know, if I just had a 10 page um, traditional brochure website, which a lot of organizations have, I was doing some work with a client the other day and they had seven pages and they'd been indexed seven times. So basically every page had been indexed, but that was it. And then I sort of compared it to, you know, other websites and my own website. You know, obviously, the more content you've got, the more you're going to come up in the search results and get in front of your, your target audience, and particularly so if you've got, obviously, products. Um, it definitely helps your customers understand fully what you do. And it's, it's no longer one-way communication. So, you know, obviously, on a blog, people can comment. Um, they can share what you've written in terms of, you know, making sure you've got social media share buttons, and they can send your message out and amplify your marketing for you. Okay, well, I was conscious that it was an e-commerce um, conference, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, particularly in the, in the context of if you've got an e-commerce website. Um, this, this made me laugh, actually. This, um, I found this cartoon, um, because I think the danger is when you've got an e-commerce website, it is all about the sort of sell, sell, sell. We all get a bit carried away with our products, and we're very passionate about what we do. So we may be putting all of our, you know, built a great website, got our products on there, and it's just all about being quite salesy and, and pushing people through to sort of, you know, put things in their basket and, and buy it. Um, and, you know, yes, you do, you do have products to push, but the danger with an e-commerce website is that you have, you know, you have product pages and they may change, so they don't get indexed by the search engines. It's not static content. It's not very rich. I mean, if you look at the average e-commerce website, the actual product descriptions are quite short, and they need to be quite short because people don't want to read reams and reams about that particular product unless it's very technical, like the software examples that we were looking at earlier. Um, and it can really, you know, blogging has a role then to really bring your products to life compared to having static product pages. But also, um, one of the key things that I'm really keen on is it can help to bring your sort of products to life. So particularly if you think about the, the problems that your customers are facing or, or even the desires and the needs that they have, you can actually use the blog to sort of show the products in actual you know, context of the use or give people ideas and inspiration of how they can use the products or services. So it really helps to, to bring your brand and your business to life. If you sell a service and you're an expert in a particular area, obviously it helps to demonstrate your expertise and position you in the marketplace. Um, against your competitors and make you stand out in a, in a crowded marketplace. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how to get started with blogging and, and we'll get on to some more questions and maybe you guys can share some of your experiences and maybe some of the challenges and things that you're finding either difficult or frustrating with blogging. For me, it always starts with um, your target audience. 
and thinking about who you're communicating with. Uh, I was talking earlier today about um, being successful online and so many businesses sort of jump straight into the sort of, you know, getting on with their website and not actually taking time to understand who their ideal customers are and who they're trying to communicate with. And particularly, I always use this as a description, but what are their, because not everyone comes with a problem to your business. It might be, especially if you're selling certain products online, it might be they just have a desire for it. So what is the actual desire, need, pain, or problem? And think quite in depth about, you know, what motivates them um, to want to use your products or your services. Um, and then, obviously, you can theme your blog around that, and it will give you lots of inspiration in terms of things that you can actually talk about. So, I don't know whether you want to do this, because um, this is meant to be a workshop. This format isn't very great for a workshop, standing up on the stage, but um, in the groups that you're there, sort of sitting in your tables, do you want to just write down or share with the people next to you the topics that you've actually blogged about? Um, and just maybe brainstorm that for a couple of, couple of minutes. I know it's post-lunch, everyone's looking a bit sleepy. <laughs> it's not quite the coffee break yet. Now, if you do the five, to you know, five topics, um, you will get a cup of coffee at the end of it, I promise. Or you'll get a pillow so that you can have a little... Sarah, while people are writing their five... Yes. Can I ask you which has been your most successful post? Yes. Uh, I knew you'd ask me probably that. One I wrote on a cust customer journey, have you mapped your customer journey? And it was probably one of the blog posts that I hadn't anticipated to be as popular. And it continues to drive significant traffic in the, in the region of about 50 plus visits a month to my website. Wow. And I wrote that over a year ago. Wow, so that's your most successful? Yes. And have you won clients just through that? One post, can you identify a client you've Not actually won? Not that specific post, no. Are you able to identify a client you won through an actual blog? Probably not, actually, but I know that I, when I look at my actual website, I know that my website converts, and I always ask people how they, how they found my company, um, and I all often ask them what search terms they used. Um, so the, so blog, the blog is like a warm-up? It's a warm-up, and I often find people actually subscribe to the blog, and it sort of starts the actual sort of engagement process. They're showing an interest. They're sort of putting their hand up and saying, I'm interested, um, and that helps to build the relationship, and then they get in touch. Particularly yeah. for my, pro you know, my service, it's not often an instantaneous decision to come and, come and work with me. Yeah. How are you guys getting on there? Does anyone want to, to share the topics that they've come up with. Now, Karen, you're a seasoned blogger, so I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> what, what, your table at the back there, do you want to share with us? The lady, the lady in the red and the gentleman in the white, are you actually blogging currently? They're not blogging yet. Not blogging yet. Well, Karen, do you want to share some of the topics maybe with the group that you've, you've blogged about and what's been successful for you? Yes. And what's topical? Do you find that they get a better result than ones that are maybe more, not theoretical, but so you're, you're blogging about marketing. So if you were doing something that was saying like email marketing, but if you found something that was topical or in the media, do you, do you see a difference in the actual traffic that you get and the success with? Yeah. Mm. Yeah.
you made the connection. So again, with your, your, your ideal customers and your target audience. Yeah, I think the, um, the, the top five, top seven, top 10 can be really helpful formats. Has anyone else got any tips on ones that they've tried that have worked really well? No, no other suggestions. But I do agree with Karen that I think often if you share, you know, case studies I've found when I've shared actual content, not obviously revealed all, all the warts and all, but when I've actually applied it in a practical way and shared maybe an example of another small business, that's been really, really helpful. Zoe, do you have any yeah, good ones to share? You, you hide the names of the guilty to, you know, <laughs> to protect or try and protect the innocent. No, I think I mean I, I, I think I shared one of yours the other day, which was about search. Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> yes, it was quite quite amusing about a, a current situation which we've probably all encountered and what we do. But I think the key thing to remember about blogging is it it is not a press release stream. Um, I had a very interesting. I was doing some work um, with some public sector companies the other day and. It was very much, you could see that the blog was viewed as being sort of a corporate press release distribution service. And it literally was really, really corporate. And they were literally just taking their press releases that they were releasing to the rest of the media and they were just sticking them on their blog. Don't do it. Um, as Karen has indicated, and I think all the experience probably in the room, and I'm sure you can talk to others and, and get their, their views, if you actually put personality and share a more personal, I mean, the whole thing about a blog is it is a personal web blog. I mean, that's what it stands for. So the whole point is it is meant to be more like a conversation. So the tone of what you write and what you share, it's important to try and make that as, as engaging and interesting as possible. Just as if you were telling someone a story down the pub, you probably wouldn't put it into corporate speak and you wouldn't say, you know, an official announcement and, and make it really formal. You'd, you know, you'd share anecdotes, examples, you know, a bit of humor. Um, and obviously if that's appropriate for your business, it depends what you do. Um, try and, and, and think about you know, how you can either answer the, the, the pain and the need and the problems of your audience, the things they're struggling with, um, but also put your person, don't be afraid to let your personality shine through. Because um, writing doesn't always come naturally to most of us. Um, I love copywriting for sort of things like emails and websites, but you know, writing blog posts for me has been a bit of a revelation. Um, I know I was probably better at maths and things at school and not so good at the, at the English side and struggled with it a little bit. Excellent. And formulate ideas in your head. Yeah. Can be a great way of getting feedback. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, we've talked about blogs. Blogs are two ways. So, you know, you get a lot of comments. If you get comments and feedback, if you want to float ideas or things past your customer base, the people that are, you know, following you and engaged with your blog, great form, just as you can use other forms of social media to get research, great way of getting feedback and comments and get a bit of a pulse of your, of your customers so that you're not sitting at your desk in isolation. Um, and not getting any sort of interaction you know, with your customers, particularly as your business grows and if you've got more customers, particularly for any e-commerce business, you know, reviews and getting you know, blog comments and feedback is a, is a good way of, of staying in touch with your, with your customers. So we've, um, what's your biggest challenges with blogging? Because there's a few people who are blogging currently in the room. Um, the lady in red over the far side there who's chatting to her, her neighbor, do you, do you blog currently? <laughs> Resources. Ah, uh, boo, hiss. <laughs> yes, you're you're losing. Yeah, you're losing all of the SEO benefit in terms of having it. If you think about it, you're making it very difficult then because someone has to come off your blog and go to another site. They have to come to your website. And obviously those pages, that content that I talked about is not sitting within the core of your website. So it's not actually adding what I call Google juice 
to the actual you know, content of your site. So wherever possible, don't go for a, um, you know, you need self-hosted blogs. So that means you need it within your, integrated within your main website. Yeah, not hosting it on WordPress or you know, elsewhere, blogger.com. You want it within your own website. Otherwise you do lose all of the, the good Google benefit. Resourcing is, a, is a, an issue that comes up a lot, actually. Um, does anyone have any techniques? I have one technique that I use. I try and write my blogs in a chunk. I do respond to things that are topical, but I do set myself time in my diary to sit down for an uninterrupted morning and plan out my articles and write them, because otherwise I know that I won't do it every week. Because, Thomas, you do it every week. How do, how do you, one a week, how do you manage your time? I think Zoe's got a comment on this as well. And do you plan a set day in the week that you're going to do it, or do you just sort of get up and think, I'm in blogging mood today, I'm going to, I'm going to blog? It all depends on the dogs. If I have a good dog walk, it'll come out then. It all depends if I get the dog so walk. So Karen's at showering, yours is dog walking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I walk a dog. Yeah, good. that's a good, yeah, you should market that. Do you think dear. dog is a derivative of blog, or blog is a yeah, derivative of dog? get a dog, dog and you'll be a happy blogger, yeah. I, I actually get inspiration when I'm dog walking as well. Zoe, you had some... What? Yeah, I, I use responses from emails, so if a client's asked me a question and I've sent them a reply, sometimes I think, that's quite a good reply, so I'll respond to that email and then I'll send them another Yeah, that's a good suggestion. I've heard and um, one I suggest is think about if you're working with clients or you get like so you're getting customer feedback on a, a daily basis, frequently asked questions. So if you have common I mean I've had weeks when I've been working on like LinkedIn profiles or you know, something's been almost felt like it's been the topic of the week or, you know, things I've been asked about. Maybe the cookie regulations might be one that's gonna come up again. Um, that can be really good inspiration. Karen. Yeah, that's a really good suggestion, so product comparisons. Yeah, how should I spend on, or what, what is this product compared to that one? Because people will be using that. And then, you know, yeah, I'm, and I use the um, Google keyword tool as well. So if I get stuck for a, you know, I think of a topic, and I'll type it into the keyword tool, and it will come up with lots of other suggestions. But also going onto Google and just putting in a question, and then seeing how many search results come up and what other content's out there, that can be quite good for inspiration if you're getting a bit stuck. Um, and if you put it into the Google Keywords tool, you'll also see how many people are searching from it, for it. Because actually, from, from a marketing point of view, you know, you're doing this to attract people to your business who need to know about what you do. So actually thinking about what they might be, again, getting inside the head of your customer and thinking about what they might be searching for, if you pop that into the Google Keywords tool, you'll be able to see how many people are searching for that on a you know, monthly basis. So rather than you spend three hours writing a blog post and then it only attracts one visitor and you get really despondent with your blogging, um, you can use some of these techniques to, to help decide on you know, your theme and then the topics that you're actually going to, to blog about. Any other challenges? I mean, resourcing is definitely one that keeps coming up. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good question. So the question was, how long should you know the optimum length of a blog? I mean, I I tend to aim for between 300 and 500 words because I think it should be enough that someone can read when they're having a cup of tea <laughs> um, and not war and peace. I mean, I, I tend to write one blog post a month that's about a thousand words and I tend to use that for my, e you know, I use it for my email marketing as well. Um, so I use it across a couple of different channels. But um, if you've got a really big subject, the key is probably then to break it down into parts or steps so that you're not necessarily writing. I mean, I've gone onto some blogs and they've been so long and I thought, oh, I haven't got time to read this. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that, that's the danger. And I've done ones that have been even shorter, where I've, particularly because I obviously come across lots of helpful tools and tips, and I tend to share them. I've got a section on my blog that I really useful stuff. And I, I, you know, they're really short and sweet, but they're literally just like, have you heard of, you know, whether it's an email marketing system or it's a video, cheap video making tool or, sorry, Chris. Um, you know, it, it's some little tool that I can share with my audience. Um, and those blog posts might only be 100, 100 words. Um, long. 
you know, they're really short and sweet. But I aim for between 300 and 500. Um, I think the longer ones tend to, you know, switch people off because it's just, they're going to find the time to sit down and sit down and, and read it. Anyone else got views on length of, length of blog? Zoe, Karen, experienced bloggers? Yeah, I, I mix up the length. Karen, do you? No. Yeah. No. 500 is a good target. Yeah, you've got to get... Yeah, it's your keyword density. So obviously you need to aim between... Normally they say on web pages it's between 3 and sort of 6% on average. So again, in a blog post, it's a similar principle in that you need to get your sort of keyword density at the right level. So if you just mention that keyword once that someone might be searching for it, say in the headline of the blog, but you don't mention it again in the article or you only mention it once because the article's like really, really short, obviously you'll minimise the, the search engine optimization sort of benefits. So... I, I think 300 to 500 is the sort of sweet spot to, to aim for. Okay. Resourcing is an interesting one. I think if you struggle with um, blogging, um, there are options to outsource it. Um, I'd probably, there might be a few people cringing in the room who would say, oh, no, don't do that. I think, you know, you ultimately still have to, you know, you can't completely get people who sort of say, just take it off my hands and... and do it for me, and that's not going to work. But if you, you know, if you need some assistance with blogging, um, you know, I, I won't be shy to confess that sometimes I, I run some of my pieces past my copywriter to have a look at, just to check that I'm, you know, a bit of, bit of guidance in terms of sometimes, because writing isn't something that I've, you know, that type of writing isn't something that I've, you know, naturally, um, you know, found easy. Um, so at times I've, you know, asking, you know, a friend, even poor husband, to have a quick read through to check that my ramblings actually make some sense and are interesting for someone to read. Um, so, uh, you know, don't, don't be afraid to, to ask other people to take a look at it and uh, sort of sense check it if you're not feeling confident about your blogging. Yeah, I'm sort of done really. So unless there's any more questions on blogging, maybe it's there. Yeah, sort of article submission sites, yes. There are other sites, that, there are sites that you can go and submit your articles on. Um, one caveat, I mean, recently um, Google changed their algorithm that they use for indexing sites, and they've been penalizing backlinks from sites where people have actually been buying lots of links. And the problem with article submission sites is if they don't re-spin the article, if it's just the same as it's been on your site, it's duplicate content to, to Google as well. So you've got to be a little bit careful. And what I'd say is there's probably no shortcuts. Um, you're better off identifying complementary blogs where you could actually put content, approaching them to see whether you could be a guest blogger. I'm having a conversation with a client at the moment, actually, where we're coming up with a, with a concept that we can actually approach a blog and pitch the idea to get her, her blog article featured um, and build quality backlinks to your site because there is no benefit now with Google going out there and trying to get volume or cheating and trying to get you know, quick, quick wins. Um, because they are penalizing people for, for doing that. And I think some of the article spinning and submission sites have been sort of almost like downrated by Google, um, so that they, you know, they basically are not counting those backlinks as of particular value. So you've got to be a little bit careful about it and obviously be quite choosy where you place your content. And there's no shortcut to doing good quality you know, approaches to get your blog article featured somewhere else and then backlinking to your your website. Any more questions? Another one. You're a professional writer, aren't you? Yes. <laughs>
Yeah. Ideally as well, do some research in terms of visiting their site, looking at the content, and then actually writing an article and sending that article to pitch it and say, I've written this article that I think would be really useful. You know, and actually, like you say, build the relationship with the, you know, the owner of the blog. Because I get ones where I'm approached and they say, we could write this article for your website. And I just think, well, what are they going to write? You know, I'm not, not so necessarily going to... I'm very selective who I let be guest bloggers on my own website. So if you are going to approach, it's probably better to, to write the actual blog post and show that you've taken an interest in their business. You're not just feverishly going out there trying to get backlinks, that you've actually gone out, looked at their site, considered who their audience is, and you've written something that's, that's relevant and ideally isn't just a complete rehash of, you know, or the same article that you've written on your, on your own website. Zoe. That's a really good point, because particularly the laws, you know, and in the technical environment, it changes very frequently. So, yeah, if you quote any facts or figures or, you know, give technical advice, you'll need to, to go back and check that it's still relevant. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Well done, Sarah. Brilliant.